All right. Well, happy Monday. I hope you had a good weekend. And um, just want to uh, want to get started here. I, I do want to point out in the regular expressions lecture um, on this page, this resource page, uh, these two sites, Regex 101 and Regexer, these are really great sites to kind of just test out your regular expressions. So, like, you know, for example, you had like T La Russa and I don't know, you know, 100 55 or something, and you had to like extract information out of this, right? You know, the, you know, whatever. Okay. Um, uh, and you want to say like, okay, let's look for digits, and these are these are kind of the matches, and you can do like, okay, you know, one one or more digits, and let's uh, let's create a capture group out of this, and you can say, okay, these are the uh, here, you know, here are the things that we're extracting, all right, and you know, not not that this is the, uh, and so you have you know. Um, Two groups here, and this is this is one match that that matches something or something, right? And so you can um, you can test out, you know, you, you've got text that you want to kind of test out and see is it is it working? Where's the did I did I do the wrong thing? Active franchise. Where's franchise history? I think I clicked the wrong thing. Well, anyway, okay. Wait. All teams in major league history. Franchise history. Right. So you got something like this, and. Uh, All right, so you know how do we how do we extract information, um, and so you know it, it it's it's picking things out as, as far as like scores go, um, and if you want to kind of just make sure, oh, uh, here's the uh, it matches the okay, but anyway, so you can test out the the regular expressions. the uh, The other site here also does a good job, regexer. Uh, similar, you can kind of just kind of paste stuff and search for, you know, whatever whatever thing that you're looking for. Slash w with a with a literal dot, or you can do I guess uh, a through z for if um it's not uh, oh not slash that okay uh, right so. First, first name or something. Okay, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So good, good places to just kind of test out your regular expressions if you're uh, struggling a little bit with that, or maybe you had a great time with it. Um, but regular expressions, I think they're so cool. <laughs> I think a lot of stuff is cool. I think this whole class is cool. All right, and you guys are cool. All right, um, today let's talk about object-oriented programming. Um, there's kind of a lot of stuff to uh, to talk about. We're just kind of going on, um, getting into programming aspects of R, and so object-oriented programming, style of programming that focuses on defining different types of objects and functions that can be applied to those objects. Um, R is a little bit quirky. We actually had there's four different OOP systems available, which is <laughs> like three more than most other languages have. Um, so we have S3 and S4 and RC and R6, and there's different opinions about the object-oriented systems. I'm going to follow kind of Hadley Wickham's lead, and we're just going to um, we're going to say cover S3, which is the most important one, and then I'm going to just skip straight to R6. We're going to not bother with S4 or reference class RC. As far as object-oriented system paradigms go, uh, S3 and S4 use what we call generic function OOP, and then RC and R6 use what we call encapsulated OOP. Um, 
all object-oriented programming systems store information <laughs> in objects and anytime you do a function with an object we call that a method so that part is universal for object-oriented programming systems go um, but uh, but there's a huge difference between encapsulated OOP and um, generic function OOP. So most other languages use encapsulated OOP. So Python, for example, uses encapsulated OOP. And in, in encapsulated OOP, the methods belong to the objects or the classes. And so when you call a specific function, it looks like object dot method and whatever arguments you're going to give it. And the object encapsulates both the data and kind of fields in the data as well as the behaviors such as the methods. So, you know, in Python, you have this, uh, you have lists, okay? And lists have methods like if you wanted to add something to a list in Python, you would do list dot append. So, you, you know, you're creating a, a list of fruit names. You would do like fruits dot append banana or something. And that would add banana to the list of fruits. And that's how you would do stuff in, in Python. Um, or, you know, kind of a more of just like a generic or a real life example or something. You can think of, let's say you have a camera object. And the camera object has information that it keeps track of, like, how many pictures it's taken and how much memory is available or even maybe the pictures themselves. Um, and the camera has verbs that it can perform such as shoot a photo or you know focus or record video or something like that. And uh, R supports encapsulated OOP in their R6 and uh, reference class RC systems. On the other hand, R also supports generic function OOP. And in generic function OOP, objects or classes store the data, but the objects don't contain methods. The objects don't contain information about the methods or what actions you can do. Okay, instead, you have what we call generic functions. And the function um, will look at the class of object that's coming in and the function will behave differently based on the object it receives. So if you think about, say, the verb shoot, okay, the, what that verb means, what that word shoot means, means different things based on the object I give you. So for example, if I hand you a camera and I say shoot it, you're going to point the camera at something and take a picture, okay? If I give you a hockey puck and I say shoot it, you're gonna like look for a stick to hit and you're gonna try to hit the hockey puck towards a goal, okay? If there's a gun, shoot would mean you know aiming at a target and pulling the trigger. Uh, you could even shoot the breeze or something and that's gonna be, um, I guess, to chat idly or something. And, and in that case, the, the behavior of you know, what, what we do depends on the object um, that, that we give it. And, and in the verb shoot, the fact that it means different things depending on what, what's been given would make it a, a polymorphic function, okay? A polymorphic function is a function that behaves differently for different input types. The S3 and S4 systems use polymorphic functions, okay? And uh, in R, basically all of your base... Um, Everything in kind of base R and you know the stats methods and stuff that's all um, implemented using the S3 system. So here's here's an example of a polymorphic function, the function summary. The function summary, um, you give it basically a vector of values and it, it will do different. It will behave differently depending on what you give it. So um, we're gonna load up the diamonds data set. And the different columns in the diamonds data set have different kinds of information. So the column caret, you know, I think this is, has like 50,000 um, rows in it. And uh, the column caret contains information about how much the diamond weighs, the, the size of the thing. And it's a numeric variable. And so when you ask for summary on a numeric variable, 
it calculates the min, the max, basically a five number summary plus the mean. Um, the column cut is a factor, okay? It's an ordered factor. And so when you call summary on a factor, what does it do? It doesn't give you a five number summary because it's, uh, it's a categorical variable. Instead, it tallies up and tells you how many diamonds are fair cut, how many diamonds are good cut, how many diamonds are very good cut, right? And so, you know, as far as the end user goes, okay, um, this person wants just a summary of the column. They just use the one, same function, summary, okay? But internally, R says, oh, you're asking for the summary of a numeric variable. Let me figure out the minimum, the max, the median, the quartiles, and stuff like that. Uh, you say summary, and you give it a factor, and it says, oh, you're giving me a factor. Um, let me uh, tally up how, 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 these, um, how many of each um, category appear. And so internally, the code that is being run is different for the caret column, and it's different for the cut column, okay? And so, so this is what we call a generic function or a polymorphic function, okay? In that it behaves differently depending on the, um, the type of object, right? So other examples of polymorphic functions are things like plot and print, okay? They behave differently depending on the object that you give it. So, yeah, central to any object-oriented system are the concepts of class and method. Class is a definition of the object. Class will contain different fields. And a method is a specific implementation or, or function for a specific class. You can think of class as uh, defining what the object is, and methods define what the object can do. Another important idea for object-oriented systems are this concept of inheritance, okay? A lot of times our classes are uh, organized in some kind of hierarchy, and so if you can't find a method for a particular um, specific class, okay, like a child class, then it's going to look for the method for the parent class, okay? And, and we would say the child inherits behavior from the parent. So, you know, you can kind of think of, uh, you know, animals, um, organized in some kind of hierarchy, right? So dogs are mammals, and mammals are vertebrates, and vertebrates are animals, or something like that, right? And so if you look at dogs and cats, they're different species, but they're both mammals, and so there's gonna be, you know, things that are in common and similar between them versus like, you know, dogs and birds, um, which are both vertebrates, but, you know, you know, different and stuff, and so, you know, something that applies to vertebrates can still uh, um, uh, apply versus, you know, like insects are, you know, invertebrates and, and things like that, right? So, so you have different kinds of things that, uh, that inherit um, this, this, this concept of inheritance. So, you know, in R, um, ordered factors uh, inherit from a regular factor, okay? and tibbles inherit from a data frame. So those are examples of uh, inheritance. How does R figure out um, which method to use? Okay, that's all hand, um, that's this part of this concept of method dispatch, right? So it's the idea that, you know, if I say shoot it and I give you a, a camera, Okay, your brain says, okay, what did you give me? You gave me a camera. All right, so that means I need to do something with this thing, right? So um, the, the method dispatch is, you know, what does your brain do to figure out what you're supposed to do with the object, right? R does something similar, and you say print, and R is going to look at the class of object you gave it, and it's going to figure out how is it supposed to print it, right? If you give it a list, it's gonna print it out a certain way. If you created a linear model object, right? So you create some kind of model in your regression class and, uh, and internally it's stored as a list, but when you say print this out, it doesn't print it out like a list, right? It prints it out in a different form, okay? Uh, a data frame, data frame internally is stored as a list, but when you ask R to print it, it doesn't print out like a regular list, it prints it out in this table form, right? So these are 
different methods and R has to dispatch the correct code, right? So internally it's code running and R has to say, okay, you gave me data frame. So we're gonna run this code when you call for print. Okay, you gave me a regular old list. So we're gonna run this code when you call print. You gave me a linear model object. So we're gonna run this code, right? And all of the, you know, every bit of code, you know, is basically like catting stuff to the screen and, um, but it's, it's different for each thing, right? Same with summary and plot. Yeah, go ahead. Is the generic function the same as the polymorphic function? Yeah, so R handles generic functions by, by using polymorphic functions, yeah. Okay, so again, just kind of a list of the different systems. S3 is the kind of first, simplest, and most flexible um, OO system that R has, and it's also the most important one. We have S4. So there's like weird things you can do in S3. It just you can do a lot of stuff on the fly. S4 basically um, locks things down, and makes everything formal, um, and has rules, um, which some people like um, having. And then um, reference class RC is a uh, does the encapsulated OOP. And R6 is not part of base R. You have to load a library for it or install a library for it. But it also does um, uh, kind of encapsulated OOP. And, um, and that's, the, that's the encapsulated system that we'll look at. OK, let me go ahead and give you your first view quiz answer. Letter D, D as in dog. D as in dog is the. Um, First view quiz answer, D. We also have to talk about base types for a little bit, okay? Um, these are kind of the internal C level types um, that the other object oriented systems are built out of, things like lists and atomic vectors. They're technically not an object oriented programming system, but they provide the building blocks. So, as far as base types go, um, these are your things like atomic vectors, lists, environments, um, functions. Those are all base types. There's also like more exotic ones like promises and calls and things like that. Um, but uh, and and you figure out the type base type by using type of. Uh, unfortunately, the things are named a little bit funny, <laughs> and there's two different kinds of functions within R. You have your regular old functions, okay? And, uh, and so like the function mean, you can ask what's the type of, and it's a function, and uh, R says it's a closure when you ask for type of function, okay? And you can say, is it a function? And R says true. The function sum, and, and it's, it's not apparent to most, is that uh, the function sum is actually different <laughs> And that is what we call a primitive function. It's implemented using C. So mean is written in R. So you know a lot of kind of code, a lot of functions are written in R. But then some of these kind of more basic things like calculating the sum of a vector of values uh, for speed and uh, different things, it's actually implemented in C. Okay, and that's a it's what we call a primitive or a built-in function. Right, and so um, so R handles that uh, a little bit differently. Now you can find out if um, something is a base type or something is an object using the is dot object function. Okay, so I'm not expecting any of you to be writing any kind of C code, but basically um, all of our objects are built on top or out of the base types. Okay. Um, Uh, all the objects have an attribute for class, okay? So if it's an object like a factor, a data frame, uh, remember, you know, you have the base types and then you can ask, you can attach class or attach attributes um, and attributes include things like the dimensions and, and stuff like that. But um, um, if it's an object in S3 or something, it's going to have class 
um, defined to be something like that. Okay. Um, so you can just see, is, is it something that's a pure base type, at that meaning that it doesn't have a class object, class attribute? Um, you can just call is object, and that will return false if it's a base type. Uh, let's go ahead and talk about the S3 system. So to see if something is an S3, unfortunately, we don't have a direct function for it. We can ask, is it an object? And if it's S3, it'll say true. There is a function to see if something is S4, and you can say, is it S4? And if that says no or false, then it's good. it's going to be S3. So if, if is object is true and um, is S4 is false, then um, then it will be S3. Okay, um, but yeah, uh, we don't have a function to just say is it S3. So here I can create a data frame, and I can say is the uh, data frame an object? That's true. Is the data frame S4? That's going to be false. Okay. Is um, the column x an object? No, that's just an integer vector, so that's false. What about the column y? No, that's a just a character vector, so that's a false. Now, if I made this a factor, then it would be true. Okay, then it would be an object. Generic functions in R, we can identify generic functions because all generic functions use a function called use method, right? Um, and that's kind of the defining feature of a generic function. Um, so this is, this is how we make a function to be generic, meaning if, if I want this function mean, right, this function mean will behave differently based on what kind of uh, object I give it. And so you might be like, what do you mean by different means? So we actually, um, there is a, you can give mean uh, a vector of numbers and it'll calculate the mean of that numbers. But you can also give it like dates, okay, a vector of dates and it will calculate the mean or like the average date of those things, right? Which is a little bit strange, but, uh, but you can do that. There's other kinds of objects that you can handle, uh, hand off to mean and it's gonna try to calculate the mean of those things. Uh, and so because it's dispatching different different bits of code, <laughs> something's going on, um, the, it's a generic function. And you can tell something's a generic function um, by asking for the definition of the function. And inside the definition of the function, there's basically just one line of code, and it's use method, use method, all right? So, um, I don't know if you knew this, but you can just type in the name of a function, and as long as you don't include parentheses, it won't execute the function. It'll give you the internal code that R runs for that function, right? It's just like, it's just in printing out the internal code. So for example, I can say um, mean, okay, and don't, no parentheses, and there's basically just one, one line that defines the function, use method, okay? Something else that's a generic function will be something like print, okay? Print, use method, print, okay? Or uh, summary, okay? Summary, use method, summary. So all of these functions are just kind of implemented uh, by using um, as a generic generic function, okay? Um, LM, all right, LM is not a generic function and this is all the code that gets run when when you create a linear model object, right? It takes in you know these arguments and it says it does all of this stuff and basically returns uh, z, you know whatever uh, z, right? So it's adding all of these things to z is basically your list of output things, right? Your dot model and all of this stuff that it has created, right? So these are all the this is the the code that gets executed when you call lm. But these functions, like mean, print, summary, which are generic functions, I'll use use method. Okay. Now, um, so uh, so that's how we know it's a generic function. When you just kind of ask for what's the definition of the function, you're going to see this thing a call to use method. Right. Um, there's certain generic functions that are. Uh, implemented in C rather than R, and, uh, and these are things like sum and C bind and stuff. Um, these are internal generics. Uh, also the square bracket, which we is technically a function used for subsetting, 
that's uh, that's also implemented in C. And those are internal generics, but but uh, a little bit of a of a side note here. So how does so what is the code that actually gets run? So when I call print, okay, when I say print, all I get is use method print. So what code actually gets run? So if I say let's make a factor. Okay, so x is a factor, and it comes out like AAB. What is actually getting run? Okay, um, what's run is a function. There is a function called print.factor. Okay, and print.factor looks like this. This is the code that gets run for print.factor, and um, and it basically cats information to the screen, and it's going to kind of cat stuff like this, and um, and it's going to kind of Output, you know, there's a thing that says here. Here are the levels and stuff, and uh, and it and it outputs stuff to the screen. So this is the code that gets run when you just do something like, hey, print x. Okay, it's going to output this to the screen, and it's basically um, calling this kind of stuff. Okay, so so how does it how does it know? Well, again, it searches for this function called print dot factor. Okay. Um, if you call mean for a date class object, it looks for a function called mean.date, right? So when you call mean and it sees that use method, all right, it's actually searching for mean.date, okay? So this is, this is how um, things get executed. Um, you know, so you have, um, so I can make a data frame, and I can say x is 1 through 3, and y is uh, 6 through 8 or something, right? And df gets printed out like this, right? And what's being executed when I call print on df is this code for print.dataframe, right? And so this is the internal code, and it says, oh, you know, if it's length 0, it's going to print out data frame with 0 columns and percent %d rows if... Uh, if not, it's going to do this, and otherwise, it's going to kind of output. You know, as a this this is all the code, and we don't have to read all of this. Um, but um, but this is what gets executed when we print out a data frame versus print out x, which is a factor. Okay, right? The fact that the internal code that gets run is different. Um, what's happening is we're we're calling different. Uh, um, we're just calling print, but R is dispatching a different method. Okay, and the the way it works is it searches for a function called generic dot class. So whatever generic function we're doing, so if we're looking for the mean function and we give it a data frame object or something, it's going to search for mean dot data dot frame. Okay, if we give it a, a date class object, it's going to search for mean dot date. If we say print and we give it a factor, it's going to search for print dot factor. If we give print a data frame, it's going to search for print dot data dot frame. Okay. So, um, so this is how it goes. Now, um, modern kind of style guides will say use an underscore instead of a dot because the dots can get confusing. For example, print.data.frame is the name of the function that gets uh, executed when we um, print a data frame object. But it could also be confusing, for example, what if there is a function called print.data and uh, and we have a frame class object? Okay, then um, then <laughs> then the name of the function would be the same, right? Print.data.frame. Now uh, we, we probably won't. Okay, and similarly, there's um, t.test, and this if we had um, there is a function called t which we use to transpose matrices and transpose. Um, data frames, um, and if we created an object class called test, then you know the transpose method for a, a test class object would also end up having the same name of t.test, right? So eh, not recommended. We we would rather use um, underscores and stuff. Um, this is uh, there is a package called prior. I've never had to use prior outside of this lecture, <laughs> but. Um, the prior package will give us some information about whether a function is an S3 generic, and it also gives us information about method dispatch. So it's useful for this lecture as far as like 
learning how S3 works, but I've never actually had to use it um, outside of this lecture. So um, t.test is not a method. It's not the t method for test class objects. It is its own generic function. So, um, so we can, uh, hey, is it a generic? And um, we say, is it an S3 generic? And that comes back true. Um, and we can say, okay, uh, if it's a generic function, what are the different methods, right? How, does t, how is t-test implemented? And it says, oh, there is uh, the default t-test. And then we also have t-tests that get um, the, the version of the function that runs for a formula, okay? And again, you can kind of verify, is t-test really a generic function? You can do t-test, and yeah, you see use method, right? Anytime you see use method, it's a generic function. It's gonna be a polymorphic function that behaves differently depending on what you give it. And, uh, and so as we know, at t-tests, um, you know, do a, what, two-sample students t-test or something like that. Um, I guess the Welch test or uh, whatever when you give it um, data. Whereas t.data.frame, okay, is what? It transposes a data frame, and so that's a method. It's not a generic, it is a method. It is the t method, or it's a, it's a method of the function t that applies to data frames, right? You have the default um, function. And if you think about it, you know, when you ask uh, R to transpose a matrix, right, internally what's going on? Um, a matrix is stored as an atomic vector with a dimension attribute, and we say transpose it. So here, X is uh, a matrix with four rows, and we say transpose it, and it transposes it. Now it's a matrix with three rows and four columns, rather than four rows and three columns. Um, here, I've created a data frame with three columns and four rows, right? Four rows, three columns, columns A, B, C, and I just say transpose. All right, and R transposes it. And if you think about, like if I, I'm not gonna do this, but if I gave you a homework assignment that says uh, write code that's gonna transpose a matrix, write code that transposes a data frame, you'd have to write entirely different code, right? Because internally, the matrix is stored as an atomic vector with a dimension attribute, okay? And how is the data frame stored? Internally, it's stored as a list, right? So how would you transpose the list? How would you transpose the matrix? Um, you have to kind of write almost entirely different code there. Um, and But for the end user who just types in T, transpose the matrix, transpose the data frame, it just says, it seems like, oh, it's just doing what it's supposed to do. So the, the experience for the, the user is similar, but internally you think, okay, what's, what's going on? The code is actually quite different. Well, it's actually like you can see, okay, what is being executed when we do t.default, which is what gets run when we run, do it for a matrix, versus what gets executed when we do t.data.frame, okay? And so there's actually some internal C code which is used to transpose a matrix, okay? And that's how it, it's uh, the transpose is done quickly. And then t.dataframe, it kind of cheats in that it does this just this very heavy, uh, there's this function that does as matrix, right? You take the data frame and you turn it into a matrix. That actually does the heavy lifting for us, okay? And then, and then it calls next method, which just says, okay, now that it's a matrix, just transpose it like a matrix, all right? So that actually does the heavy lifting for us. But again, if you didn't know this was possible, you know, and you think about, okay, I've got a list and I've got to transpose it, you know, it's a lot more of a complicated problem, okay? Um, if you have some kind of generic function, um, you can see all of the methods that belong to the generic function. So these are different versions of the mean function. So we have mean for date objects, the default mean function, mean for diff time objects, mean for POSIX XCT, POSIX mean closure object. I don't know what these are, right? T-test, actually, there's two different implementations of T-test. One, you get kind of the the vector values and one you can also give it a, a formula. Um, you could say, you know, do a t-test for, you know, column y based on column x or something like that. Have you given me one view quiz so far? Let me give you your second view quiz answer. The letter C, C as in cat, 
C as in cat is your second view quiz answer. Um, you can see all of the generics or see all of the methods that are available for a certain class. So not just what are all the methods available for a certain generic function, but all of the methods for a certain class. So class TS is for time series objects. What kind of stuff can you do with the time series objects? So you have print, you have plot, but all of these other things. Um, you know, turn the time series as a data frame and stuff like that. Okay, let's just start playing around. Let's see if we can make some new classes. And um, our S3 system is very kind of uh, accommodating and uh, doesn't have any kind of strict requirements. And if I said, hey, you know what? I want to create a new class of object. And we're going to call this the fruit class object. Um, we can do that. And R is just like, all right, you want to make fruit class objects? Let's do it, all right? And so you use this function called structure. Here, the contents of the object is a list that contains apple. And I just say class is fruit. And ta-da, now we've defined uh, an object of class fruit. Okay. You can also just create an object. Here I created a, a list containing banana. And then after the fact, I say, oh, you know what? This list with banana, let's call it fruit class. Okay. And we can just say class of y is now fruit, all right? And R is just like, OK. Because um, the way it implements class information is just there's an attribute. And we're, all we're going to do is we're just going to basically stick a label on it that just says, this is fruit. And, uh, and, and R says, OK. Now, I believe you. It's fruit, all right? This is a new class object, right? We're just basically putting a new label up and says, OK, now we got to look out for this. And, uh, and we ask, hey, what is the class of object X? And R says, can't you see the label? It says fruit, OK? And, and that's all it is, right? Um, and we can say, hey, is class X a fruit class object? And R says, yep, it is, OK? Uh, and, and we do uh, inherits, OK? We say, does X inherit from class fruit? And the answer is yes, OK? so. Um, now you might, um, uh, you can also just ask is class of uh, x, you know, equal to fruit? Um, and, and we'll do a comparison between just inherits and that. Um, there is a difference. Um, the class can actually contain a vector of values. So for example, diamonds is a, a data set, a data frame. It's a tibble, and it actually contains a vector of uh, these three characters, right? Um, tibble, t, tbl underscore df, uh, which inherits from tibble, which inherits from data dot frame. Um, the, the cut variable in diamonds is an ordered factor, and so its classes are ordered, which also inherits from factor. So you can have um, multiple kind of classes for it, right? So you can have uh, you know, Fido is your dog, and that's going to inherit from dog, which inherits from mammal, which inherits from vertebrae, which inherits from animal, okay? Which inherits from, you know, living creature. And, uh, and so all of those kinds of things apply to, to Fido. Um, you might just say, hey, why, don't, why do I have to use inherits? Can't I just say, is class, is class of x equal to fruit, okay? Well, um, the difference is that because class can return a vector of values, when you say, hey, you know, class of the cut um, variable, is that equal to factor, you're going to get back a, a vector. And it's going to say false, then true, right? It's going to say this is ordered. Is it e ordered equal to fa uh, factor? No, but factor is equal to factor. So it's, it's preferable to just use inherits. Does diamond inherit from factor? And it's going to check, you know, does this inherit uh, from factor any, anywhere kind of along the way, right? A lot of the object types in R have what we call constructor functions. Now this is not a requirement, so we can create fruit class objects and we just said, hey, this object is class fruit, 
when we didn't make give it a constructor function. But a lot of the uh, a lot of the classes have um, constructor functions. Constructor functions are basically the function you use to create objects of that class. So, for example, in R, if we wanted to create a factor object, we use the function factor. If we wanted to create a data frame, we use the function data frame. Okay, and so, and if we wanted to create a linear model object, we use a function ln. Okay, and so these are the constructors that create objects of that particular type. So, if we wanted to create a function that creates uh, classes, uh, fruit class objects, we would create a function called fruit, and this function would produce objects of class fruit. So here this function is just going to take in some variable x, uh, object x. We're going to check to see if x is a character vector, and if it's not, it will throw an error. Um, otherwise, uh, uh, if, it, if x is a character vector, then all we do is we return an object using structure. We'll put x inside a list, and we'll say class is fruit. And so we're going to create a new fruit of pineapple and throw it into Z. And so Z is going to be a list containing pineapple, and it has the attribute uh, class is fruit. And now we have a fruit class object. So this is a very simple example of a constructor. Okay, Most of your constructors will be a little bit more complicated. Um, here, LM is a constructor function. I'm going to create a linear model uh, from the data set MT cars, and I'm going to store the object as LM underscore MT cars. And I say, what is the uh, class of this object? And it says class LM. And when I say print, print out your linear model, it prints this out, right? It comes out with the call, and it gives you like coefficients for the slope and the intercept. Um, and that's um, and that's an LM object. Okay, so this is what happens when we call print on an LM object. It prints it out this way. Internally, the LM is a list. Okay, internally, LM object is a list. And if we wanted to, <laughs> this is silly. We wouldn't. We shouldn't do this. But I could say, you know what? Let's change the class of LM empty cars to data dot frame. Right, and ours like, okay, that's weird, but all right. Actually, it doesn't even say that's weird. It just says okay, and then now, I say print it, and R says, okay, I think this is supposed to be a data frame, and so when I try to print it as a data frame, I have these column headings, and I have zero rows, right? And it seems like we lost information or something. Um, but we didn't. The information's still there. The coefficients are still there. It's just R is now treating this like a data frame. Okay. It's kind of like, you know, you go to the store and you know you can take like a TV and you just basically peel off the UPC of a different object, right? You you take like the price tag of a different object and you like tape it on over <laughs> the UPC of the TV, and then at checkout. The machine doesn't know any difference, and it's like beep. Oh, this is a T-shirt for six dollars. Okay, okay, and, you know that's stealing, and you'd go to jail. Um, but uh, but the machine doesn't know, right? And and similarly, R, you just we said, hey, this is not this is not LM. This is data frame. Treat it like a data frame, and R is like, okay, well, this is weird. I got zero rows now, um, and and it prints it out like this. Okay, so. Um, S3 doesn't have any kind of formal checks. It just says, oh, this thing's a data frame? It's a data frame. This is a fruit? Okay, it's a fruit. This is a LM? It's a LM, and it, and it just treats it as that, okay? So basically, just don't do crazy stuff like that, okay? This lack of built-in validation can be problematic, but it's not much of a problem if you don't try to, like, you know, break the system, right? Um, R is not going to protect you from yourself is the, uh, the warning here. Um, let me go ahead and give you your last view quiz answer. Last view quiz answer is A, A as an apple. And let me show you how we would go about creating new generic functions. So here I want to create a new generic function called quotation. 
And the idea of quotation is that it's just going to return a quote um, for an object based on what kind of object it is. And to make it a generic function, we're going to use use method. And so this is the one line of code that turns the function into a generic function. So we say quotation, use method quotation, and now it's going now this is a generic function. All right? So um, here we will create our first method, okay? The first method, this will be what gets executed if quotation receives a fruit class object, right? So this is going to be called quotation.fruit. And what R is going to do is if it sees a fruit class object for quotation, it's going to search for quotation.fruit. And so quotation.fruit is just going to return a string that says fruits are an important part of a balanced diet. And so here, here's an object of class fruit. So we say, hey, what is the class of X? Cla X is class fruit. And it has banana. And then so if I call quotation on X, right? So I didn't call quotation.fruit. I called quotation. What R does is it says, oh, quotation is a generic function. It says use method. Therefore, um, we're going to search for what is what am I going to search for? I'm going to search for quotation dot fruit. It just takes the class name and it search searches for that thing. So R uses the naming system, and so if you have a typo, <laughs> excuse me, in the class, right? And if class has capital F, okay, R is not going to find the find the proper um, proper function because it's going to just take this class as lowercase f r u i t, and it's going to do um, quotation.fruit, and it returns this quote. You can take existing functions, and again, this is something you shouldn't do, but here I can just say uh, mean. Mean is already a generic function, and I can say, all right, let's have uh, a new function called mean.fruit, <laughs> all right? And this is silly, but it's just going to return the number five. So if we say, hey, what's the mean of x, a banana? What's the mean of a banana? Um, and it's going to come back five, right? So because all R is doing is it says, okay, here's mean. Mean's a generic function. X is a fruit class object. Is there a function called mean dot fruit? Oh, there is. What does it say? It says five. Okay, let's tell the user five, and um, and that's it. Again, does it make sense? No, it doesn't make sense. But this is exactly what R has been instructed to do. It says look for a function called mean dot fruit. If it doesn't find it, try to calculate the mean of something. But, um, but if it finds it, uh, just do it, right? So the way it works is it just takes the name of the generic function, adds a dot, and then it tries to tack on the class. And if it finds it, it's going to execute. Um, and again, that class attribute can t contain a vector. And so if it doesn't find one thing, it's going to search for the next thing. So here I'm going to create three different methods, right? So here's our generic function for quote, quotation. And three methods are quotation.fruit, quotation.apple, quotation.default. So we can do um, methods for fruits, methods for apples, method, method for um, default if it doesn't find fruit or apple. So here, A is going to be um, uh, class apple and fruit. So when I say quotation on A, it finds quotation.apple and it returns an apple a day keeps the doctor away. Okay, B is quotation, or the class is banana and fruit. So first it searches for quotation.banana. Okay, we don't have quotation.banana, so it goes to the next and it looks for fruit and it finds quotation.fruit. Quotation.fruit returns fruits are an important part of a balanced diet. Okay, object C is class donut, right? So it's going to search for quotation.donut. It doesn't find quotation.donut, and and there's nothing else in class here, so it's going to use the default quotation, and which is, which is the default quotation, let food be thy medicine, medicine be thy food. So it just searches for um, ver uh, names of the function, quotation.donut, quotation.banana, and if it finds it, it uses it. If it can't find it, it just uses the default. Now, you can... These are just functions, so if you call quotation.apple on the banana class object, it'll run quotation.apple. It's kind of just like saying, print this out like a data frame, even though it's an LM object. 
okay? And R is going to do its best, and you know it's going to get confused. Again, this is a silly thing to do, like changing the class of the object, and uh, you shouldn't do it. But um, but R is just going to try to obey your instructions. Um, if there is no default thing, so if I remove quotation dot default, and I say run quotation, and it looks for quotation dot donut doesn't find it, it's going to search for quotation dot default and it can't find it, so it's, we get an error. No applicable method for quotation, okay? All right, there's a, there's a little bit more. Um, you'll just have to kind of go through these notes here on um, uh, finding uh, all of the stuff, and there's kind of this little bit of a quiz that you can kind of test to see if you understand how method dispatch works in, uh, in R, um, and, and hopefully that will be uh, helpful there. All right, have a great uh, rest of your day, and we will see you on Wednesday.